Well, thank you everyone for attending today. We are so excited to be able to have this program for you all and share, share more about Centennial Campus. My name is Allison Hughes and I am part of the program planning and outreach team here at NC State University Libraries. And I'm so glad you've joined us for our third and last event this semester in the Campus History Series. The libraries and its partners are working to ensure that our programs are welcoming and affirming for everyone involved. That means that everyone from event organizers to attendees has an important role to play in contributing to a respectful and positive environment. That's why we ask that you reflect on the way you pose comments and questions in the chat to ensure that they do not harm other participants. When we speak, the impact of our words is just as important as our intent. Today, we ask that you engage in this program with exploration and curiosity while being kind and intentional with your words for the sake of the community. During the presentation, we ask that you remain muted. If you have any questions or memories you would like to share, please place them in the chat and we'll collect them for a question and answer session at the end of our presentation. This program um, is sponsored by both the Friends of the Library and the Alumni Association. The Friends of the Library is a nonprofit organization that works to raise money for the libraries um, and help the students and patrons on campus. To learn more about our philanthropic organization, please find the link shared in our chat. And I hope that you, that you enjoy today's program. I'm gonna go ahead and hand things over to Andrea Sellers. Hello everyone and welcome. Thank you, Allison. My name is Andrea Sellers. I am the Assistant Director for Regional Engagement with NC State's Alumni Association. On behalf of the Alumni Association, I wanna thank you all for joining us today as we continue to learn more about the history of NC State University. I also want to extend a special thank you to uh, the members of the Alumni Association. Your support of events like these is truly excellent, and we are very, very grateful for it. And now I'm going to hand things back over to Allison. Thank you. Now to introduce our speaker, Le speaker Leah Burton. Leah directs the offices, Office of Partnerships Strategy for Corporate and Government Interactions with NC State. This includes man management of collaborations on the university's award-winning Centennial Campus. Leah works to expand corporate and government partnerships with NC State's faculty and students. She currently serves on the boards for the Association of University Research Parks and the Tammy Lynn Center for Development Disabilities. Leah holds her bachelor's degree from the University of Colorado. And we just all wanna say thank you. And we are looking forward to your presentation. Thanks, Allison. Um, well, I've, I'm grateful for being, a, for, uh, being asked to speak today and, and share one of my favorite topics with, with everybody. And, um, you know, so, and, and what I'll say is that I've, I've done my best um, to, um, to try to reflect the history of Centennial Campus and what it means to NC State and beyond. But of course, in, in one hour, we can't cover everything. Um, so I'll be interested in questions and, and discussion that, that you all have, because you'll, of course, bring up um, items that I wasn't able to, to touch on. So I do, of course, have a slideshow, and I'm going to share my screen now, and we'll get started. All right. Well, um, in the beginning, this is what um, everything that we know as Centennial Campus used to look like. This is in the beginning of, of the 1980s, and all of this land would um, eventually be slated for Centennial Campus. But um, it, had, it had been um, decades before, it had been part of the Dorothea Dix Mental Hospital. This is not where patients lived or where they were treated in the hospital, but they did use this land um, as farmland um, where the patients farmed uh, as part of their therapy. But by the, you know, by the 80s, um, 
Dorothea Dix was not using this land at all. It actually was owned, if you will, or um, you know, uh, had been transferred in, in terms of utilization over to the North Carolina Department of Agriculture. And they were doing some forestry testing and research in, in this area. But, um, but again, you know, by the mid 1980s, then there really wasn't a whole lot going on um, on Centennial campus. There were people who did, um, you know, four wheel driving and um, they did mountain biking and cross country running on Centennial campus. And those were all really good um, recreational uses. Uh, but in terms of any use that was uh, beneficial to the university and beyond, um, there really wasn't anything going on. And so um, when you think about that period of time in, in the mid 1980s, um, we think about an NC State University that was almost 100 years old, um, you know, of course, since our founding was in um, 1887. Our research expenditures at the time were $88 million per year. We had 24,000 students. And the population of the city of Raleigh was 180,000 um, persons. And, and so, you know, the, um, the reality for NC State is that we, um, we were an increasing um, uh, presence in the city. We had begun to experience a period of drastic growth. And all of the studies that NC State um, had done really painted a picture for drastic growth um, amongst our student population. You know um, that in the university business, you, you know what your future uh, student population is going to be because they're already born. And so our, our chancellor at the time, whose name was Bruce Poulton, he knew that he had to get ready for this um, expansion and for what the university truly would need. Um, but there were very few places on our main campus where additional facilities could be built. And so he began looking to this land um, that was, of course, just adjacent to our campus for the opportunity to expand. Um, he approached the governor, who uh, at the time was Governor Hunt. He was at the end of his second um, term. And he asked, uh, you know, the the chancellor asked for a portion of that land to be deeded over to the university. And really with no, no expectation or plan larger than just simply expanding our classrooms, our labs and our dormitories, which of course is, is a worthy endeavor in and of its own. And um, so, you know, the governor was already thinking about the use of that land. And so through um, either at that meeting, which I have been told it happened or perhaps at a series of meetings, um, the, chance, the chancellor was able to receive a commitment from the governor that yes, the land um, that he asked for plus more would be deeded to NC State University. But um, it came along with a charge where um, the governor was really asking the university to think about the use of that land beyond an expansion of our classrooms and laboratories. Um, and so, so Governor Hunt gave a portion of the land um, and Governor Martin the next portion of land. And, and so, you know, the, the whole thought process there and early visionaries around Centennial Campus saw that we had to move our research enterprise forward such that we would focus um, a new or a, a new um, element of our strategy around industry funded research and to support the economic vitality of, of this area. And so, um, as I say, uh, Governor Hunt gave a portion of land, about 370 acres, I believe, to NC State to begin developing Centennial Campus. But because he was on his way out, um, Governor Martin uh, came in after him, and Governor Martin gave a second portion of land to, to the university. We did purchase some additional acreage from the diocese. Um, and, and what then was compiled was about 1,000 acres where we would develop this, this new campus. And so, you know, the past focus was absolutely on teaching and undergraduate study and on a reality of a university that 
thrived majority on state funding, but a recognition that the university that we would look to in the future would have an increased emphasis on graduate research and also on a diversification of, of our funding base. And so the plans began um, to create the, the very earliest um, master plan of Centennial Campus. Over, over that five years um, after the original deed, um, a master plan was developed with the leadership of Claude McKinney. Um, Claude is the gentleman um, with a mustache and beard in both of these pictures. Um, so, you know, the strategic direction that Claude and others were given was to focus on technology development and application. And so actually very early in this process, the university issued an R RFP out of our university planning group and in fact received about 80 some proposals from faculty as to ideas that they had that NC State could use in this new campus that we were developing. Um, we hired a consultant, of course, car called Carly Group. Um, and, and the overall vision then was developed to create this innovative research campus where private companies would work in partnership with university researchers and and largely to solve society, society's grand challenges. Um, but at the same time, we would help drive the state's economy forward and we would serve as a national model for private and uh, for public and private partnerships. And um, so if we continue to like think, think forward in terms of that planning process, um, uh, we pulled this quote out of the out of the News and Observer um, from 1987, and, and in fact, actually, I should back up. So after all of that master planning um, in 1987, the master plan for Centennial Campus was approved by the Board of Governors and, and thus began the whole process of, of developing Centennial Campus. And you can see then the aspiration that Centennial Campus held um, at the very beginning um, of this endeavor. All right. Um, so, you know, the idea here is that we would create something that would complement Research Triangle Park, that this would not be a competition to Research Tri Triangle Park, that it was a, a very different model, if you will. Um, and, 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 you know, a whole, a whole lot of zoning um, went in, uh, zoning approvals went into place, working hand in hand with the city of Raleigh. And, um, and you can see, though, that in the very beginning of the planning process, before we ever even um, built a single building, um, there were a lot of hurdles. And um, if you if you look back through the archives, there is article after article after article questioning um, the model of Centennial Campus, um, honestly, the reasoning of Centennial Campus. Um, and, and what's also interesting, if you look back at that period of time, there was a tremendous amount of pushback even within the university. Um, it, the, the new College of Textiles was slated to be the first academic unit here on Centennial campus because they were the next, um, you know, the next uh, construction opportunity in the university's schedule. And the chancellor decided not to put it on main campus, but in fact, as I say, to put it here on Centennial campus. Um, and, and the faculty of the College of Textiles were not happy about that at all. In fact, they they um, entered a vote of no confidence in the chancellor on the um, on that particular decision, and and we there was you know there was student criticism and and um, a real questioning of the investment that would take place on Centennial campus. And is there a possibility that that would that the development on Centennial Campus would somehow take away from main campus or somehow replace um, all the importance of, of our main campus. Now we know that not to be true, um, but at the time there was, there was a lot of, of criticism. And so, you know, as we then um, created new, um, new partnerships and uh, began to build Centennial Campus, we were really viewed as developing this new university, if you will, a new academic um, city here at NC State. 
I mentioned the College of Textiles. That was the very first um, fully academic unit to move here to Centennial Campus. And, and I can imagine how they felt at the time because Centennial Campus was really nothing but you know, densely forest, forested land and kudzu. Um, and so to put the College of Textiles completely over here on this brand new um, Centennial campus, I can see how that felt as though they were moving somewhere that would be very far from where the action would happen. But we did then begin um, attracting uh, corporate interest and our very first corporate partner on Centennial campus was ABB. Uh, <clears throat> ABB is still on our campus and um, you know what's interesting is how how that company has changed as the economy has changed and how our involvement with ABB and really our engagement with their technology development has changed over time. And so we built um, what is now known as the Poulton Innovation Center for ABB and they occupied that entire building. But over time, ABB actually moved to different buildings um, on Centennial Campus, only then to, to move back into a portion of, of the building again. And, and I think that that really illustrates the importance of flexibility in how we develop Centennial Campus, but also in how we engage with technology development and the companies that are, that are engaged in it. As we continued through the 90s, then we attracted our very first government partner, which is um, uh, which is the US Weather Service, and they are still on Centennial Campus as well in Research Building 3. And um, the importance of that research relationship um, certainly can't be missed. Um, and, and then, of course, we kept on developing um, some of the research buildings, Research 1, 2, 3, and 4. By 10 years into our development, we had a, a 10 year celebration uh, of the success of Centennial Campus. And you can see um, by this time, Governor Hunt was back in office um, in, in his, um, he served two more terms after, um, after he was out for one, for one term. And so um, through that period of time, we continued the development, but this was all when you look at financing of how we developed Centennial Campus, it was all either financed through state appropriations or through university revenue bond um, financed construction. We had not yet gotten to the point where private developers would invest in Centennial Campus, although that was really part of the plan all along. As we move then into the 2000s, Centennial Campus began to come into its own. It began to live up to those initial promises, if you will. We, um, we invited the Centennial Campus Magnet Middle School onto our campus in collaboration with Wake County Public Schools. And that's been a very important element of partnership with our College of Education. Um, a private developer came to campus and built a building for Lucent Technologies. Um, and you, let's refer to that building as 1801 Varsity because that's, that's the address of the building. But it was originally built for Lucent. Lucent never really fully occupied the building. Um, it was, it was empty for a very, very short period of time until Red Hat moved into that building. Red Hat grew enormously on this campus. I think they had 150 employees or so when they first came to Centennial Campus. And then they outgrew our campus. In came, um, in came LexisNexis into that building. Again, maybe somewhere between 100 and 200 employees when they arrived on our campus. And now they're up somewhere in the neighborhood of 700 to 800 um, employees. And so the, the point being that as we moved into this opportunity to invite private developers onto our campus in a way that they would be using their capital that would be to the advantage of, of our continued development, um, this really helped us move forward. Um, we uh, had our very first multi-building private development, which is called Venture Center. This is on about 10 acres of land. It was originally developed by Craig Davis Properties and is about half a million square feet of space on Centennial Campus. Again, all done um, through an RFP process that is you know, fully executed by the university with university approvals all throughout, but utilizing private capital. Um, we don't ever 
sell the land on Centennial Campus. We only lease it, so it will always be part of NC State University in the state of North Carolina. But here we're able to employ private de private um, dollars, excuse me, in order to um, in order to continue to develop our campus. Um, as we again um, continue to move through the 2000s, we actually folded the um, what, what everybody knows of as the vet school into what we now um, into what we now call the Centennial Biomedical Campus, although it's still College of Veter Veterinary Medicine. But the point being there that we are able to do the things we can do on Centennial Campus in terms of developing the campus, having multi-tenant facilities, inviting corporations and government entities to co-locate on our campus, we are able to do that um, at the vet school where we um, call it the Centennial Biomedical Campus. I went too far there, everybody. I think that puts us going along right. And so then um, an important decision was made um, that we would need to continue to expand our College of Engineering and that rather than um, retrofitting facilities on our main campus to suit that growth, we would look at a process of moving the College of Engineering to Centennial Campus over time, such that those buildings that they occupy on main campus could be repurposed for other entities. Again, the whole idea behind continuing to be able to expand our teaching and research, whether it's on main campus or Centennial campus, all throughout we have the ability um, to, to enrich the university through, through that um, expansion. And so we, um, we began that process in the first um, building for College of Engineering uh, was completed in 2004, housing materials science, as well as chemical and biomolecular engineering. And you'll probably recognize some of these faces. And um, so there was a period then um, in 2007 where we were recognized amongst our peers uh, nationally and internationally. Centennial Campus was named the 2007 Research Park of the Year. And, and what I'll say, um, especially from the perspective of, of someone who has seen all of this growth and, and has seen the continued acceptance of the Centennial Campus model, um, when, when I and, and my colleague Amy Lubis uh, started in 2000, Centennial Campus was very much um, an outlier when you look at university research campuses. And I say that because so many of them were founded on, a, excuse me, um, I don't know what happened there, but um, they, they were founded on a real estate model. And, and we, we always held to this model of collaboration, where we would invite corporations and government entities to co-locate on our campus in order to um, provide opportunity for our faculty and students to collaborate. Um, but but that, was, that was absolutely not the prevailing wisdom when you looked at, at other research parks around the world. And so I think what um, what is highlighted from this quote um, out of the award that we received is that this, this was really a tipping point for Centennial Campus where there was greater acceptance for the model that, that we um, had pioneered and in the way that we had pioneered it such that then other research parks that were either already in existence or universities that were creating their own research parks began deploying this particular model. Um, and, and ever more, it has, it has meant just a complete expansion of, of that model throughout the country and, and throughout the world. All right, so then continuing on through, um, through the 2000s, we, we opened Lonnie Pool Golf Course. And um, that, that's been an, a really important part of the offering on Centennial Campus. Um, it's nice to have a championship golf course here, but you know, it's also um, important that there be a programmatic portion of that. And so, um, you know, 
this golf course wouldn't have been put in place if we didn't also have a premier turf grass management program at NC State, and if we didn't also have a professional golf course management program. And so again, back to that um, engagement and collaboration, um, the opportunity for us to, yes, I mean, have a beautiful and, and enviable golf course on Centennial Campus, but all um, in terms of what it can offer to our faculty and students as well. And um, I, I should mention, in, in terms of the development of, of the golf course, this, this project was actually meant to be a very different development originally. And, um, and this is actually one of the impacts that Centennial Campus had from the 9-11 tragedy. Um, right before 9-11, uh, the leadership of Centennial Campus was working on a hotel, conference center, and golf course development. In fact, there were members of, of our group who were um, on travel the, uh, on 9-11 who were going to meet about that project. So it was meant to be um, together. Um, and we, we all know, though, after 9-11, what happened to the tourism industry. And so the Hotel Motel Association in, in North Carolina was, was really hurting due to the lack of, of, of travel. Um, and, and they began criticizing this hotel conference and golf, golf course project. Um, they were concerned that it would not succeed and that inevitably the university was going to have to somehow prop it up financially, which of course was not in the plan at all. But all of that to say there was a tremendous amount of criticism. So we, we stopped that project for a while. And what we decided is that we would be able to raise funds actually through our advancement office to build this golf course, of course, for all of the important programmatic elements that I already mentioned. And then uh, inevitably we would be able to um, attract a hotel developer who would then bring on that other part of the project. But um, I, I think it's important for us to, to note how, um, how that was originally um, intended and then how it actually happened. By 2013, we opened up Hunt Library and um, gosh, I could have never foreseen how important Hunt Library would be to um, to this really the, the being the heartbeat of, of Centennial Campus, the importance of Hunt Library as, um, you know, as, as a hub for uh, academic curiosity, but also um, for the way that Hunt Library put Centennial Campus on the map. Um, you can't create a building that is as beautiful and inspirational as Hunt Library and ever think that your campus is going to be the same as it was before. Um, and, you know, it's, it, I should also mention that um, after opening, Hunt Library became one of the top tourist destinations within the city of Raleigh. And so um, there really is quite a lot of pride within our city and, and throughout the state for what Hunt Library is and what it means to, to the people of North Carolina. And so um, those are things that, that are important to take as learnings as we go forward in, in the development on, of Centennial Campus. All right, so somehow there, um, yeah, okay. Somehow I think there's some slides that have been skipped a little bit. I'm sure that that's operator error entirely. Um, 2017, we opened the State View Hotel, which is a Marriott product. We're very proud of that development. Again, completely privately developed, but under the approval and, um, and eye of, of NC State University. If any of you have been to the State View, you can see that they um, that the hotel developer really took great pains to make sure that it had a reflection of what, what NC State is and what NC State can be. Um, and so we're, we're really proud of that. All right, so, um, and, and by the way, I haven't listed every single building that we developed but, um, just in the interest of time. But um, continuing on through then, you're aware that last year we completed Fitzwillard Hall, which is important to that, um, to the completion of um, the of the of the excuse me, of the engineering oval for um, for Centennial Campus. And so now that um, that is the uh, the final portion. Uh, I mean, well, 
of, of what we know now, right? Um, who knows what the future holds. But at this point, all of the College of Engineering is now located on Centennial Campus, of course, except for um, nuclear engineering. And um, that's gonna stay where it is. As we continue on, then um, you know, plant sciences building will be complete next uh, next year, and we're also proud of of what that um, of what that means. Um, I think what you'll um, what's important for us to remember about what Centennial Campus has has done in terms of just the larger opportunity for for NC State is that it has allowed us to think about. How do we create magnets of innovation and of um, prosperity for our state? Uh, so, and, and many of those begin with basic science that is meant to solve the grand challenges of our time. Um, so plant sciences initiative is important to that because uh, this is all about uh, figuring out how we feed a growing world population uh, amidst all of the challenges that you and I know are, are in place now and, and in the future. And so creating that opportunity for basic science through to application, merging that with startup companies as well as larger companies so that what comes out of that is a solution that moves out of the, from the laboratory out into the marketplace in a faster um, in, in a faster way than it would if they were all separate. And um, any of you who knew Claude McKinney, our founder, will um, will know that he, um, he was very serious in reminding us that Centennial Campus should be about backpacks and briefcases. That when you get on the elevator, there should be students, there should be faculty, there should be um, corporate researchers and corporate executives, that that, that type of merging um, of the forces is the best way to create impactful technology development and, and really to the betterment of our larger society. And I think in, in very many ways, the plant sciences building represents that original thought. And so Centennial Campus now is viewed as a national model for how you create a truly collaborative campus, um, for how you um, match the needs of industry to the expertise of a university. And um, one, one interesting um, point that I think illustrates this quite a bit um, is if you Google Centennial Campus, you will not only get information about the Centennial Campus that we know, you'll also um, unearth information about the Centennial Campus at Hong Kong University. And it's clear that somebody who was in development for that Centennial Campus had been to our Centennial Campus because because if you click on any of those images, I think that you'll find some familiar looking architecture. And um, so when we were reflecting, and this has been now a few years back um, on the 30th anniversary of Centennial Campus, we were reminded that North Carolina State University is not the same today as it was yesterday, and it will be different again with each tomorrow. As the world has changed, NC State has adapted and, and evolved, but it has always stayed true to its core mission of promoting social, economic, and technological development across North Carolina and around the world. All right, so let's, let's um, if I take you back to those original figures of $88 million of research and um, 20, 27,000 students, um, population 180,000 in the city of Raleigh. In 2020, NC State's research expenditures were $546 million, which is twice as much as the 88 million figured with inflation. So $88 million, if you include um, uh, the inflation calculation, that's about $240 million. So we have effectively doubled um, the research expenditures, even if you figure for inflationary terms. Our student body is um, much larger, it's more diverse, um, and it's more successful throughout the world. We have become a leader then uh, amongst our peers in industry-funded research, partly because 
the opportunity to develop Centennial Campus um, has led us to thinking about how we engage with industry. And of course, you know, you'd have have to be um, living under a, a, a rock not to know the, uh, the growth of the city of Raleigh over time. And so um, on Centennial Campus today, um, we have all of these companies and government entities that you see on your screen and more. Um, we have dozens of companies that have started on Centennial Campus and expanded elsewhere throughout the state, creating excuse me, creating opportunity all over North Carolina and beyond. Um, in the future, we are going to, we have a, another development coming up um, that will be a, a mixed use development on, on the site that is, is um, in blue on this particular map. It's 32 acres in size and you all will, will be hearing a lot about that as, as we move forward. Thank you very much. And, and actually I think, um, I don't know if it was in the translation, but if you'll bear with me for, for a moment, um, I, I feel like, yeah, there, I knew that somehow I was, I was missing some slides as I, um, maybe I was pushing too, too quickly. Um, so before I end, I want to point out um, these figures as well. We have, we have more than 70 corporate and government um, partners on Centennial Campus employing now 5,600 people um, that are not part of NC State University, but nonetheless integrated amongst our, our community here. About 16,000 daily, 16, daily population on Centennial Campus. When you think about residents as well as, um, as, well as students, faculty, and all of those employees with our, um, with our corporate and government partners. Uh, the, the companies that are located on Centennial Campus hire about 400 of our students every year, and we are also home to, to 28 of, of the university's research centers and institutes. So I wanted to make sure I went back to that because I, I knew I had missed that particular one. Okay, Allison, well, I think that we are ready for questions, if you are, or comments. I am ready. Um, all right, so the first first question or slash comment we had come through um came from tom dow and he he, oh. he and he um he put in the chat that the first building on centennial campus was research one Correct. and the precision engineering center in the late 80s after a grant to the engineers was presented by the office of naval research um, Thanks, tom. yeah and i as i mentioned i didn't I didn't put every single one of, of the buildings, but in that whole period of time, of course, we completed research one, research two, research three, research four, along with um, College of Textiles there. So thanks for keeping me honest, Tom. I appreciate it. All right, next question is from John Gray. And um, he asked, are there future plans to give in-person tours for old alums like me maybe in 2022 and then also thank you for a great presentation oh yeah I, we're we're always happy to to give um tours and so um if you just contact the partnership office at 515-7036 um we would be happy to give you a tour great whenever you're ready i think especially after this presentation i think people are ready to, to come visit you guys um, next is a comment from Mark Stately. Uh, he says that nuclear is not the only engineering program not on Centennial Campus. I graduated from biological and agricultural engineering and they are still in Weaver Labs at the corner of Western Boulevard and Dan Allen. Also true. Thanks, Mark. Um, all right, and we have one more comment from Jim Hackney. And he says that I was chairman at the NCSU Board of Trustees from 1985 to 87 when we completed the state property transfer, purchased the Catholic Diocese Oval property, hired Carly Capital, developed the master plan, and got it approved by the Consolidated University and the state. He said those were exciting times. Mm -hmm. So I should, um, I should also mention a couple of things that are important to that time. Um, the reality is that uh, the way that our state laws read in 1985, for instance, uh, would not have allowed us to do what we do on Centennial Campus. 
Um, of course, you know, many people are aware that um, uh, of the Umstead Act in North Carolina, which prohibits uh, public entities from uh, competing with, with private enterprise throughout the state. And, and it's not that, um, that we were looking for that competition in particular, but we knew that if we are creating something like Centennial Campus, there would be an inevitability of um, you know, the university having real estate and private developers having real estate as well. And so Centennial Campus is exempt from the Umstead Act. And um, when we are when we are bringing private developers to the campus and they are signing a land lease, for instance, they are paying money to the university that is put in uh, a fund that fuels infrastructure around the campus. And so, again, um, but before Centennial Campus would, was developed and some of the very early enabling legislation was created, we wouldn't have been able to um, we wouldn't have been able to take in money from private developers at all, um, and we wouldn't have been able to create real estate that allows us to lease to university and non-university tenants. And so we did receive um, the benefits of that very early enabling legislation. And then I should mention that by 2001, um, there uh, was enacted the Millennial Campuses Act throughout the state of North Carolina so that other public universities in North Carolina have the ability to create a centennial campus-like development, and they don't have to go back and get all those same legislative approvals. And so, you know, there, there are and have been efforts at UNC Charlotte, at ECU, at UNC Chapel Hill, um, and others, but, but really all on, um, on that original um, work that was done by NC State. Thank you. All right, um, I have a question from Stuart S. He says, great presentation. And especially for those of us alumni living abroad now, it's fantastic mm -hmm. to get the chance to see how the university is growing. I was wondering, given the uniqueness of the Centennial Campus, even within the triangle, is there much work alongside UNC Chapel Hill and Duke on Centennial? Well, I think um, you know the majority of what you would look look at is is that our faculty um, work with those at UNC and Duke all all the time. So um, you know they don't have to have their own Centennial campus, or they don't necessarily have to have a presence here in order for us to collaborate with them. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. And of course, um, you know, there's there is an increasingly large um, opportunity um, in the health sciences when you think about our College of Veterinary Medicine and some early research that can then um, naturally dovetail over to the medical schools at UNC or at Duke. So there is a natural um, opportunity there, and we, we see that alive in um, in our faculty across the board. Hi. Um, Kevin Lai asks, as a member of the student body Senate during the early 1990s, I sat on a committee planning the route for a monorail connecting to the Centennial Campus. Is there any additional history available about this part of the project? Absolutely. Um, so there, there are a couple of, of key parts of, um, of that that I should point out. There was a real uh, there, there was a recognition in our original master plan, master plan for a couple of things that I, I think I probably skimmed over too quickly. Number one, that if we are going to be creating this new university city, if you if we will, uh, something that might be a population of thirty thousand and and beyond each day, a bunch of them better be living here. On, on Centennial Campus. And so our one of our original commitments to the city of Raleigh is that at build out, we would be one third residential. Um, now, you know, the, those development pat patterns, um, you know, have, have waxed and waned over the years. And we do have three different types of, of residential, some that is 
for purchase, some that is for lease, and then some that is student residential. So that's always been an important, and you'll see the development of residential um, continue to increase uh, in the next years. But then that other element was that of public transport, and how would we move our, um, our students and our faculty between the two campuses? Of course, everybody knows now that we do that through the Wolf Line bus transportation, and that's fine, but, um, but the uh, earlier ideas were that we needed to be able to move people more quickly and that that monorail would be a way to do that. We did have some early um, relationships with companies like Bombardier, for instance, and that would have an, an engineering um, connection in terms of collaboration. But um, let's be honest, there's a reason that um, the monorails only exist at Disney World, right? Um, they're, they're, they're not... Um, particularly economical, if you will. And so we, we have let that go, but um, you, you may be aware that right before the pandemic, we were testing new types of autonomous transport uh, around campus. So I think that you should um, keep your eyes open for what that looks like in the future, because um, you know there'll only be increasing pressures um, for mass transit uh, between the campuses and beyond. Um, and, and we'll see, as I say, more of that in the future, but, but um, the monorail definitely got sidelined and we shouldn't expect that one to come back. Um, this question is from Dave Provost. Were there any other locations considered for Centennial Campus in the original planning? Oh, no, not at all. I, I think you should actually look at it the, the other way, um, is that this was the only place where NC State was going to be able to expand. And the question was, are we going to just expand or are we going to create something like Centennial Campus? Um, and, and so there, there wasn't any um, alternate location. And in fact, once you start thinking about the high costs of, of land, that's when you, you know, that's when you sort of move away from a model like Centennial Campus and, and where you, you move into something that has to be much more lucrative from a real estate perspective because you have so, so many um, higher startup costs um, in land acquisition. And so, um, yeah, there wasn't any other location suggested. All right. Um, Colin K asks, asks does the plant science building present any interesting precedents or firsts for Centennial? Um, gosh, well, there's a lot of firsts. Um, you know, how it, um, how that was uniquely developed in terms of funding structure, um, that, that's a first, um, you know, the first uh, element of a, a, um, a building with greenhouses on. I mean, these are just the superficial things that are different about that building. But the real departure that the Plant Sciences Building represents is the creation of a truly multidisciplinary facility. Um, and so, you know, as opposed to um, the engineering buildings, for instance, that are focused on those particular disciplines, the Plant Sciences Building. Um, will be inhabited by disciplines across the university, all with um, a focus on uh, the creation of um, plants that are better suited um, for our future. And again, you know, the ability to feed a growing population. And so that that's really the biggest difference. You know, some of the other smaller things um, we, we will, we do have some small space within that building where we will invite corporate partners. Um, and we are beginning to talk with some companies about, about those spaces, but um, but the, the academic focus is, is the true um, game changer for that particular building. And it's, it's already standing out as a national model and it's not even open yet. All right. Um, so this question is from Calvin Johnson. He says, I really enjoyed the presentation. In what ways did the RTP, in what ways did the RTP influence the origins of Centennial Campus? And how did NCS, NC State direct it to evolve, direct it to evolve to its current unique status. Hmm. Um, you know, I think that there's no way that we could think that Centennial Campus would ever um, be possible without RTP. 
it's not possible. Um, you know, there was already an acceptance within our state for something um, like a research campus. RTP had already broken through and, um, and so we, we wouldn't have, have had the opportunity to develop without RTP. Um, having said that, then, you know, they are, they are a very different model. There have been only a few times in, in our history where we've competed against Research Triangle Park for, you know, a company location. In fact, I think what we see more of is companies that we might be working with and we say, hey, we don't really have the exact right space. We'd still like to work with you. You know, our faculty and student want to be engaged, but a better location is in RTP or vice versa. And so, um, and so that, um, you know, I think we have fed off of each other's success. And gosh, I'm so proud of the continued evolution of Research Triangle Park. I, I think that that, that evolution began when Bob Giolis um, took over and then has continued uh, with Scott Levitan. And I have great respect for both of them as, as visionaries in this space. And, um, and so in the same way that we are looking to continue to change and we are looking to them um, as an example, um, I, I hope that they uh, do the same. Okay, all right. This question is from Jordan Nance. He asked, can you talk about the evolution of architectural appearance on Centennial? It seems to have moved in a more modern, bold direction with more recent buildings versus earlier buildings, which have more of a, of a traditional office park appearance. Mm -hmm. What can we expect moving forward? Jordan, I really think that's probably out of my area of expertise. Um, you know, we like some brick at NC State. And so, you, you know, you absolutely see that on on Centennial Campus. Um, and you're right, the architecture has changed over time, um, has continued to be modernized, um, but I'm, I'm really not the best one to talk uh, to about that. I, I think that uh, the University Architects Office is a better, um, a better source for an answer in that way. And, and I don't ever um, claim to be um, an architectural mind. I know what I like when I see it, and um, but but I'm really not driving uh, that vision at all. Um, but contact the University Architects Office about that question. I will tell you one thing, um, you know, in particular about Hunt Library that has stood out for me um, because it stands out so much. Um, before that building was completed, I guess this was at the end of 2012, right before uh, two. 2008, or I can't remember, um, but but right before the, the library opened and I had a chance to take a tour of it and I'm walking around that place. And I'm, I mean, I was just amazed at, at um, the bold vision that was created and executed there. But the first thing that came to my mind was, man, I hope somebody in PR is ready for this because we're gonna get it we are going to get it. And, um, and I just thought, you know, we weren't quite out of the recession yet. And it just looks so beautiful and so expensive. And I just thought to myself, you know, the news and observer is going to be critical of this, or the legislature is going to be critical of this. And what I found then over that next year of, of Hunt Library being open was not anything what I expected. Um, I mean, it was just a um, across the board adoption and love of that gorgeous facility. And so, you know, my takeaway from that whole, um, that whole process was when, even when you're a public university, if you think big enough, and if you create something that is as inspirational um, as Hunt Library is, everybody wants to be part of it. And that's that's an excellent thing, um, and and so I'm, um, I'm I'm going completely also out of my um, purview when it comes to um, what Hunt Library means to the larger library network of NC State because that's not my expertise, but um, but I think that probably does mean something for the importance of the architecture of of Hunt Library and and how it was executed. And I will just tell you that there are some companies that we have. Um, that we have recruited on Centennial Campus where Hunt Library has been the game changer for them choosing Centennial Campus. And, um, and so uh, I'm, I'm forever grateful for that, um, 
particular building um, and for the adventurous architecture that it embodies. All right, well, I think that is the end of our presentation today. Thank you so much, Leah, for your great presentation. I know I learned so much about Centennial and its tremendous impact on this university. Um, we are gonna be dropping a chat or a survey in the chat. Be, please feel free to take it and give us your feedback on this presentation and the campus history series as a whole. And we will be reaching out um, next semester for a new slate of programming. Thank you again, everyone, for attending, and I hope you have a, a great rest of your day.